and welcome to uh, the afternoon bell. My name is Ellen Desmond and I work in the Bureau of Student Wellness at the New Hampshire Department of Education. Um, and YouTube live Mondays, Tuesdays, Thursdays, and Fridays. Uh, at 3 p.m. for the afternoon bell, it's our opportunity to um, discuss issues with our community partners, provide supports to New Hampshire educators, families, and students as New Hampshire learns remotely. Uh, you can find our live broadcasts as well as previously recorded broadcasts and sessions on our YouTube channel, which is NH Student Wellness. And uh, we also encourage you to follow us on Twitter at NH Schools and on Facebook at NH Student Wellness, where you can find live morning coffee chats weekdays at 9 a.m. and a wealth of other resources. Um, the department is also updating our remote learning website, nhlearnsremotely.com. So check that out for info about remote instruction and supports. Today, our topic is safety in the home. And I uh, just wanna kind of orient us to what we're gonna be talking about today. Uh, injury prevention is all about keeping children and adolescents out of the hospital and emergency departments and safe in their communities. During this time, children are looking for things to do and may find ways of amusing themselves that could require a visit from emergency medical services. During this presentation today, um, our guest presenter will discuss ways to mitigate risk around some very common spring uh, injury issues like drowning and falls while still having healthy fun, which I'm very excited about now that we have some springy weather coming this weekend. Um, our presenter today is Jim Essen from the um, Injury Prevention Center at Dartmouth Hitchcock, where he is the program coordinator. And uh, Jim has worked in injury prevention for the past 18 years. He's a certified child passenger safety technician and also serves as a police officer part-time in a local New Hampshire community. Jim works with the trauma program at uh, Dartmouth Hitchcock Medical Center and with the Children's Hospital at Dartmouth Hitchcock, also known as CHAD. Welcome, Jim. I'm going to hand it over to you. Thank you, Ellen. Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us today to talk about what I consider a very important subject, and that's preventing injury in children. And of course, with the pandemic and the environment that we're in it right now, um, we have more children at home. And obviously that provides more of an opportunity for uh, injuries in the home um, due to different sources. And we're gonna talk about what some of the most common ones are and how we can deal with it. We're going to learn what injury prevention looks like in the age of COVID-19. We're gonna address some of these leading causes of injury. And we're going to provide tips on preventing some of the most common injuries that we're seeing and um, hoping, hopefully preventing them down the road. So let me just give you a little bit of background. Over the past five years, unintentional injuries in New Hampshire um, have been the third leading cause of all deaths. Uh, and that's for all ages, not just children. So heart disease would be number one, which is probably no surprise to anyone, uh, followed by cancer and then unintentional injuries. After that, you'd have um, respiratory issues and then stroke and a list of others. But to think about the number of people that are put in the hospital every year due to unintentional injuries and some intentional injuries, it's, uh, it's pretty scary to, to, to contemplate. We're gonna talk about some injury prevention strategies, um, including active supervision, knowing what the risks are, and being prepared for an emergency, knowing what to do in the event that a child or anyone is injured. Injury prevention to me is really simple. It's all about putting a barrier between us or the person and whatever could cause the, whatever the potential cause of injury would be. That can be something as simple as what we're doing here with education. Uh, it can be laws, um, advocacy, advocating for different things um, like requiring uh, car seats in vehicles or life jackets on boats. Uh, it can also be using protective devices like seat belts. The other um, place that we can really help out too is uh, emergency medical services or, or being the first responder. Even if you don't have a lot of first aid skills, if you understand some of the basics, for example, if, if someone's choking, if you can do the Heimlich maneuver that can reduce 
the amount of injury they might suffer or even uh, prevent death. So it's that kind of thing that we're really working on when we're talking about injury prevention strategies. One of the first ones we're going to talk about was something that we were um, contacted about by the Northern New England Poison Center. They've seen a 15% uptick in poisonings over the past, uh, well, over the past 30 days. And the time frame that they that I'm using right here is March 16th to April 14th. Um, pediatric exposures in cases in New Hampshire, um, since social distancing have started, um, have been 30 days. And it's also been all residential calls. So we need to take a look at why this is happening. And because again, we have more people at home, we've got an increased opportunity. We've got more time at home means more chances to get into products while exploring. We're finding that medications are the most common substance that the poison center is getting call, called about. Second would be cleaning products, which is big all the time, but especially right now. And then followed by cosmetics, personal care products, those kinds of things. You can see the little chart over on the right-hand side of your screen. Those are the top 10 causes of poisonings in a normal environment. They're, it's pretty much the same as what we're seeing right now. What's kind of interesting with all this is while we've seen a 15% increase in children's poisonings, we've seen a 59% increase in adult poisonings with a lot of that coming from cleaning products where people are not only cleaning their houses and there's potential for fumes and that kind of thing, but they're also cleaning the packaging that their food's coming in and in the process, um, perhaps contaminating those food items. So that's something to, to keep in mind as well, um, how, and how quickly that can occur. We mentioned some of the common cause of poisonings that the poison center is seeing, some of the more uncommon ones that they're seeing too, that they've seen an uptick under the plants and pesticides. Obviously some notable increases in exposure with ant traps being the main culprit, who would have thought, but main ant traps are, are um, one of the things that, that's poisoning the kids. And when you think about it, children are curious, they want to know what's inside that packaging. They'll rip it apart. They can get it on their fingers. They can put the fingers in their mouth. It's that kind of thing that, that can occur. So it's the kinds of things that we need to look at that we might not normally consider that can be the issue. It's still a small portion of the exposures, but it's out there. And especially with spring right now, and I, a lot of folks seeing insects in their houses or near their houses, it's something to be aware of. So here are some tips that the Northern New England Poison Center has and that we would like to get out to everybody. Um, be extra aware of the potential poisons in the home. Keep them up high and out of reach. Locked is better. Lock boxes are great. Um, something that you can, but even a lock cabinet is, is better than nothing. Something that we can use again to provide that barrier between the child and the cause of injury. Things to include in this list would be medications, hand sanitizer, cleaning products, cosmetics, and then some of the other things that we find in the home that might not be something we normally think about, but little coin batteries can be something that a child can swallow. They can activate in the body and provide severe burns. Um, also Tide Pods, and we're not talking the Tide Pod Challenge, but we are talking about um, little kids getting into that, maybe they think it's a snack and, and eating on those. Um, even folks who normally store these things safely may overlook them amid the changes brought on by the pandemic. We're all distracted. There is so much out there right now. And all parents think about the, the workload that, that they all have right now, that all of you have right now, um, with children at home, trying to teach them at home, um, and then keeping them active and, and interested in things. Anything that's used should be immediately put away after you're done with it. And it's important to always follow the label directions carefully, especially with the cleaners that we're using right now. This can include how long the product must be on a surface, does the room need to be ventilated, and do children and pets need to be kept away? 
Something else to consider is that when you have these cleaning products, a lot of us think that one is good, two is better. But when you combine some of these things like bleach and ammonia or even bleach and vinegar, they can create fumes that are dangerous, not only to the children, but that can result in harm to anyone that's in the house. So again, important to, to keep those separate um, and use those where you need to, but sparingly if you can. Some resources for help. The Poison Center phone number is 1-800-222-1222. The Northern New England Poison Center has some great resources on their website. Uh, you can just Google NNE Poison Center and it will come up. Um, they, they are huge and they do a, a lot of programs around the state of New Hampshire, focusing not on just what we could consider what we would consider traditional poisoning, but things like vaping and other um, potential issues that could harm people. Uh, we always keep this phone number handy. You can even get uh, magnets from them or stickers that are still available that you can put on your phone um, if you still have a land-based phone. But again, the information is there and it's free. So another common cause of injury in children, especially when as things start to warm up, are falls in the home. And you can see I put three different examples here. One would be stairs, which are an issue for all ages. Another would be window falls, uh, especially when we're looking at second story and up falls. And then the third would be within the home, um, people climbing up on things that weren't designed to be climbed up on. Um, and we see that all the time, even with older folks getting on a chair to get to reach something. Um, it's a great way to, to end up in the hospital. So some of the strategies for prevention, we wanna create a safe space for the kids to play. We can do that by installing safety gates on stairs, guards on the window to prevent falls. Uh, with those guards on the window, you can actually get plastic um, wedges that will go on the window. You set those so that the window can't be opened any more than four inches. But an adult in the event of a fire or something where you might need to get out quickly through a window, an adult can slam that window up, break that very easily, and you still have that uh, e method of egress. Uh, we also want to keep small objects and cords to window blinds out of reach. And we want to make sure that we're securing top heavy furniture and TVs. TVs have lost a lot of weight over the past few years, but for a child, they can still be an issue. And we want to remember that children like to climb and they will climb up on dressers and bureaus. And if they pull out those drawers, making them heavy on one side, that can fall over and crush them. So we want to work on that kind of falls prevention as well. Another place where falls can occur, playgrounds. So it's important when you go to the playground, especially since it's still cold out, that you make sure that the playgrounds have soft material under them, such as wood chips, sand, or mulch. But keep in mind that with the cold weather, those items are probably frozen. So if a child lands on them, they're not going to provide a lot of impact protection. They're still going to be an issue. And um, when it gets warmer, they'll, they'll provide that cushioning that you need, but maybe think about not having them climb quite as high. You want to make sure you're reading the playground signs and using the playground equipment that is right for the child's age, making sure that they're not going higher than they should making sure that there are guardrails that are in good condition that can help prevent falls. And especially some of the older playgrounds that still use wood, double check those because over the course of the winter, that wood can loosen up, um, the frost can heave the, the supports up and um, loosen the nail screws, that kind of thing. So just be aware of that. And then looking out for things in the play area that can trip your child like tree stumps, rocks, um, anything like that that can be an issue for a child to trip over is something to do everything you can to, uh, to remove from the area. 
So now that the weather is warming up a little bit, we know that the children are going to be out and they're going to want to use their bikes and their scooters and their skateboards and, and have a good time, which is great. But we want to make sure that they're using the appropriate protective equipment. We especially want to promote uh, things like helmets uh, when they're riding any of these things and making sure that they're using the appropriate helmet. We'll talk about a little bit more about that in a minute. Um, and that any other protective equipment like elbow guards, knee guards are appropriate. So for skateboards, elbow guards, knee guards are, are wonderful. For bikes and scooters, they may actually interfere with using that um, mode of transportation. So you wanna be careful about it. So let's talk about helmets for a minute. You've got two helmets right here that both look exactly alike. One is called a multi-sport style and the other is a true multi-sport helmet. And what's the difference? The multi-sport style helmet meets the Consumer Product Safety Commission guidelines for biking. And that's pretty much it. The multi-sport helmet meets the guidelines for biking, but it also has, if you check in the helmet, another little tag that says that it will meet the guidelines for skateboarding. So even though these helmets look alike, they don't function the same way. And it's something that fooled me for years. I didn't realize this until I, I really started getting into it. But the multi-sport style, great for bikes, better to get a true multi-sport if their primary sport is going to be uh, skateboarding or using scooters or something like that. This style of helmet also is great on the skateboards because if they fall over backwards, you can see how it comes down a little bit more on the back of the head. That really does a good job of protecting the brain stem so um, in, in the back of the head a little bit more um, than, than a regular bike helmet. Would. I mentioned the Consumer Product Safety Commission. On their website, you can download a brochure, which is called Which Helmet for Which Activity. I've taken a, just a little bit of this and put it here. And what it does is it talks about the standards that each sport would require in a helmet. And each of the helmets, if you look on the inside, will have a label, should have a label and it will tell you um, the different standards that it meets. So it might meet the right standard for biking it, or it might not meet the standard for biking. It's that kind of thing that we wanna be very careful of. And even though we're out of winter right now, we also recommend the use of a multi-sport or a snow sports helmet for sledding and for ice skating because we want to, uh, the children protected that time of year as well. But just be aware that this exists and it can be a huge help for programs or for parents in knowing which type of um, activity and which type of helmet to get when they're out. So every year we run an activity at New Hampshire Motor Speedway. It's a free bike ride for kids. We set, the, the only goal is promoting helmet use and safe bike riding. And this is a picture of one year. This just shows some of the kids that were getting ready to, uh, to take off and go around the track. We will do that again this year, probably in August because we've been moved from June. But what we also do during that time is take some time to review some of the basic street safety rules, like making sure that crossing the street at, at crosswalks and obeying the traffic signals and watching out for cars. And also take a look at what your town has for guidelines as far as riding on sidewalks or riding in the road. What does a town require for the children when they're riding their wheeled vehicles? So we talk a lot about helmets, how great they are, but here are two places we never want them to use them. One is on a playground, because it can become an entrapment hazard. It can get stuck and they can choke. And the other is when they're climbing trees or just climbing just about anything with the exception of rock climbing or indoor climbing gyms. That's, we do want them to wear a helmet certainly at, at those times because of the things that have the potential of falling down on them. But again, never use the helmets, even though we, it's counterintuitive. You think you would, the helmet would help protect you when you're on the playground from a fall. We don't want them to do that. Another hazard that comes up as the temperatures warm up is drowning. And one of the, one of the things we're really cautious about here in New Hampshire 
is a concern that the, the water, the ice has just gone out um, on Lake Winnipesaukee and Lake Sunapee and some of these other ones. And the water temperatures aren't much above freezing at this point. At best, they're going to be in the 40s. It doesn't take long in 40 or 50 degree water for hypothermia to set in. And it's important to note that in the US drowning is the second most common cause of unintentional death for children after car crashes. Nationally, 43% of children childhood drownings occur in open water and 38% in pools or in hot tubs. We mirror that da national data here in the state of New Hampshire. And think about as a kid, when you were growing up, the swimming holes that you used or the rivers that you went into, uh, the, the bodies of water that, that may have been murky. And these are where we see the drownings that are occurring here in the state, the majority of them. Drowning deaths happen most often in the spring and summer months in New Hampshire. And then more than 50% of drowning victims treated in emergency departments require hospitalization or transfer for further care. And this compares to 6% for other injuries. So somebody goes into the hospital with a head injury from, um, from a bike crash, they may or may not have to go into the hospital for any length of time. But we know that at least half of the drowning victims, and we call them near drowning, victims that are treated in emergency departments are going to end up requiring hospitalization. They're also probably going to have a longer length of stay because if they've been underwater for longer, periods of time, brain injury can set in pretty quickly. So how is this happening? What's going on? We know that inadequate supervision, including from technology distractions, has a big part of this. We want to make sure that all children are supervised when they're near the water, when they're in the tub. Think about the bodies of water that you have around your house right now. And think about over the winter, what do you have for open buckets or barrels of water um, that may have frozen up over the winter or filled up with snow and now they're melted? Those are potential drowning hazards. If you take a look at the bucket you get from Home Depot or some of these other places, right at the bottom, there's a, a picture of a child that drowned that could that, uh, falling into the bucket. And there'll be a note that says a child can drown in as little as an inch of water. It's true because a lot of them are top heavy. So they fall in, they can't get out. So keep in mind that, that these uh, um, dangers might exist around the area and it's a good idea to empty out any water container. Cold water immersion with a corresponding loss of mental and physical control is a huge, huge issue. It doesn't take more than 50 seconds of 50 degree water to start to feel the effects and, and start to lose control. And without a life jacket on, the chances of getting to shore are pretty poor. Um, unsafe conditions, including fl fluctuating depths, fast moving currents and murky water. Um, if you've ever been to a, a beach anywhere in New Hampshire, you know that in one area, it can be three feet deep and you take a step and all of a sudden you've fallen into a hole that's four or five feet deep. Same thing happens with the children. They fall in, they can do that and they're way over their head. Risk taking, especially by male teens and young adults is a huge issue. Um, diving without checking what's underneath the water um, can cause some, some um, brain injury or other injuries. And if they pass out or are knocked out, they'll drown. And then little or to no swimming or self-rescue skills are something that we are looking to address in a lot of different ways. We're gonna talk about that in a second, but I wanted to just talk a little bit about the river water and the ocean temps that we're seeing right now um, and what the average is. So a river temperature can be anywhere from 29 to 79 degrees Fahrenheit. Right now, they're averaging about 40 degrees. Ocean temps right now are in the high 30s to low 40s. So it doesn't take long for that hypothermia to settle in, and, but everybody wants to get out on their boat. Uh, they want to uh, try out their kayak. The water's fast. If they go over without that life jacket, they're not going to have the time to get to shore to save their lives. And it's those self-rescue skills using the appropriate equipment that's going to help them out. But keep in mind what the water temperature is in the body of water that you're going into. Safe Kids New Hampshire, Safe Kids Worldwide has some safety tips. I'm just gonna go over these real quickly. Uh, make sure young children are with, aren't within arm's reach 
of an adult during bath time and watch kids of all ages when they are swimming in backyard pools. Watch kids when they're in or around water without being distracted. Keep young children within arm's reach of an adult. It's then a nice to get something called a water watcher card or something that will remind you that you're the adult in charge. And if you have to leave the area where the children are, if it's a pool, if you have to go in and get something to drink or, or use the bathroom, turn that over to another adult and have them actually say, yes, I'm in charge now. I mentioned this before, you wanna empty up, empty all tubs, buckets, containers, kiddie pools, anything that a, that a child could go into and put it upside down. Close toilet lids, use toilet seat locks to prevent drowning for the younger children. Keep doors to bathrooms and laundry rooms closed. Install fences around home pools. So pool fence should surround all sides of the pool and be at least four feet tall with self-closing and self-latching gates. We need to be careful because even if a pool has a fence around it, if there is a doorway from the house that goes directly to the pool, that's not considered a fence. That's something that the child can easily open, get out and get into the water. Then we need to know what to do in an emergency. Learning CPR and basic water rescue skills can help save a life. One of the things that we've seen here in New Hampshire more than once um, are multiple drownings in the same body of water at the same time. And what happens is somebody gets into trouble, could be a child. Another child goes in to help that child. And then the adult that's there goes in to help that child and they get in trouble. And so even though the intention is good, all of a sudden we've gone from one potential drowning to three potential drownings. So again, important to make sure that you've got those basic water rescue skills and that if you don't need to go into the water, if you can reach something to them, do that. That's going to be your best bet. One of the things that the American Academy of Pediatrics is really pushing right now, and rightfully so, is learning to swim. Again, this is, can be considered a self-rescue skill. All family members should learn to swim, not just the children. If, if an adult doesn't know, there are lessons out there specifically for adults. And we know that you can get into a basic water safety class with your child as early as age one, but the American Academy really recommends children begin formal swimming lessons by at least age four. Um, there are some communities in the state like Concord that offer free swim lessons to children who might not be able to afford it. And I know here in Lebanon, the CCBA offers um, lessons for all children at least 80% off if they show need. So there might be uh, that kind of um, uh, that kind of program going on in, in your town that could help the children as well. But regardless, teach them to swim, help them learn the, the self-rescue skills so they can help themselves. So this, this next subject can be kind of touchy, um, but what, we've, what we're doing here is making sure that when we talk to people about firearm safety, we're doing it in an atmosphere that, that kind of addresses the fact that we can all agree that certain things are bad. Suicide is bad. We can agree that um, a child getting injured by a firearm is bad. Whether you like firearms, you don't like firearms, there are some, there's some common ground out there. And that's been one of our um, big pushes so that we can all work together to help keep kids and, and adults safer. These are some of the things that we're working on here at Dartmouth-Hitchcock. And they're also being worked on uh, all over um, the, the state. But we wanna make sure that we're storing guns and ammunition safely and separately. We wanna make sure that we're talking to our kids and their caregivers about firearm safety, firearms in the home, um, what to do if you see a firearm, leave it alone. Um, and then disposing of guns that aren't needed in the home or if there's a, a mental health issue, making sure that the home, that there are no firearms in the home. These are the things that we wanna teach. We wanna store firearms in a locked location, unloaded, out of reach and out of sight. We wanna store ammunition in a separate locked location same thing, and keep the keys and combinations hidden. It's important to note, I've talked to a lot of folks and I'm one of them. Um, I'm a police officer, I've got um, firearms. And when um, I was talking to my youngest daughter who is now 20, but at the time was 
uh, 11, I said, you know, where, where are the keys to my gun safe? And she knew exactly where they were. And it was really important to, to recognize the fact that kids are a lot smarter than we give them credit for. So I changed the way I totally changed the way I did everything after that. But your kids probably know where things are um, and it's easy for them to access it. So keep that in mind. When a gun is not in a lockbox, um, always keep it in your line of sight. Make sure all firearms are equipped with effective child resistant gun locks. Gun locks, again, are a barrier. They're not the end all, but they can help to do, make that delay so the child has a harder time getting to the firearm. If a visitor has a firearm in a backpack or anything like that, provide them with a lock place to store it. And leaving firearms on a nightstand table or other place where a child can gain access may lead to injuries or fatalities. And these are the kinds of things that we share with um, patients and with our pediatricians and encourage them to have that give and take, that talk about it, what they can do. When we talk to our kids, we want to explain how a gun uh, that they see on television or use in a game is different from a gun in real life. A gun in real life can really hurt people. We want to teach kids never to touch a gun and to immediately tell an adult if they see one and talk to grandparents and parents of friends your children visit about safe gun storage practices. New Hampshire has a negligent storage of firearms law. Here's the actual RSA and which is revised statute annotated um, chapter 650. And essentially what it creates is a violation if um, anyone gets a hold of your firearm, um, then uses it in the commission, uh, uses it and hurts themselves or somebody else. Uh, it kind of creates that, um, not just the, the civil liability, but the criminal liability as well on there. One of the key things that we always wanna talk about too are the difficult times. A lot of people going through difficult times right now. Being at home, um, if you're not used to it, can, can create a lot of stress. Being at home with younger children can create even more stress. If a family member is going through a difficult period, like a depression, like a relationship breakup, drug problem, Make sure they can't get to your gun. Learn ways to get help for them. Um, as you can see the National Suicide Prevention um, Hotline is right here. But the big thing here is to, if, if you have a family member that's going through something like this, see if you can give your firearms to somebody, a friend to hold for you in a safe location so that they're not accessible to that person. Um, firearms are used in about 50% of all suicides not just in the state, but nationally. And when we look at that, we realize that, that firearms are almost, almost 100% effective, uh, which is a horrible way of putting it, but in, in suicide. So we wanna make sure that um, we have this information and that we're doing our best to keep people away from it. Lastly, I was told years ago that whenever I'm doing a presentation, I should have a picture of my dog in one of the slides. So I decided that having my horse and my granddaughter in the slide would be just as effective. Um, my name is Jim Esden. My information here uh, is right here and it'll be up later on. Feel free to contact us at the Injury Prevention Center. Feel free to contact me if you have any questions or if there's anything we can do to help out with your programs, we wanna do that. Uh, we want to make sure that we're keeping not just kids out of the hospital, but that we're keeping adults out of the hospital as well. So whatever you need. And I guess at this point, we'll open it up to any questions that anybody has. Awesome. Thank you, Jim. We appreciate that. Um, I actually have a question for you personally that I'd love to kind of post on our chat. Um, I'm wondering if you have, given that, not that people have, um, a ton of, of an abundance and overabundance of time necessarily right now as they're juggling lots of different um, things and lots of different priorities that have shifted given this remote learning and working environment. But in the event that people are looking for additional trainings or um, you know virtual resources online, um, do you have any recommendations of you know places for general injury prevention or intervention? 
Um, you know, I'm thinking about things like the Red Cross, you know, they have online certification courses for CPR and first aid and feels like that might be a, a great use of time um, right now while, while people are at home and have their screens up and things like that. Do you have any other resources that you would recommend some really great national resources or um, statewide collaborators that you would recommend people check out? I do. So um, nationally, uh, my go-to is Safe Kids Worldwide. When we're talking about children, they have some great resources on there that you can download, use, um, great tip sheets, all kinds of videos, different programs. Um, the American Academy of Pediatrics is another wonderful resource. They've done some great work, especially on the drowning prevention. They have a drowning prevention toolkit, which is, is again, that's starting to become our go-to for that type of information. Um, the American Red Cross, the American Heart Association, both, both programs are great. Um, specifically, I'm talking CPR, that kind of thing. Um, but the Red Cross, of course, has the swim lessons, as do a lot of YMCAs are offering those as well. Um, locally here in the state, if we're talking about something like mental health, NAMI New Hampshire is a great resource with some folks that can um, offer support and guidance. Um, and can direct you where to go locally in your community, the community mental health centers, those kinds of places for additional supports. Absolutely. We had, um, we've had some folks from Norman, New Hampshire on and they're wonderful supporters and, and partners of ours. So we always appreciate a, an extra plug for them. Great. <laughs> I also really appreciate Jim. I'm really glad that you highlighted um, the importance of removing lethal means um, of, of suicide. Um, I, I know that that is something that, especially given this time of the pandemic um, and the, you know, just uh, the wealth of um, emotions that are running high. And, um, you know, we know that, that people are feeling pretty lonesome and that depression tends to creep in in, in times of crisis like this. And um, so I, I absolutely really appreciate you kind of highlighting that. Um, that's just a, um, a really sure way of, you know, in, ensuring that we keep kids safe and, and adults too, is just removing it in general. Absolutely. So thank you. Great. Well, thank you for this great overview of all the things that uh, we need to keep in mind as we try to avoid those everyday injuries. Um, I think, you know, the, this time of crisis with COVID-19 can, you um, kind of overshadow some of those risky situations that um, present themselves in everyday life. So it's always good to have a little reminder, especially as we move into spring weather and more and more people are getting outside and all of that. We really appreciate you taking the time to remind us of all of these things. Thank you. Excellent. Great. Well, thanks for joining us. Um, to those of you who are tuning in, thanks for joining us on the afternoon bell session on this Friday afternoon. Uh, join us on uh, Facebook Live at 9 a.m. for morning coffee chats. And we'll be back here uh, all next week here on YouTube to present um, additional afternoon bell sessions. We really appreciate you tuning in. Uh, feel free to like us, follow us, and share these posts with folks that you feel um, would benefit from them. And um, we will talk to you next week. Have a wonderful weekend and be